So today, we're going to focus on the new system. Again, this is material that could form a, uh, a course unto itself. It's implicated in learning and memory and emotions. And I'm sure many of you have already taken some courses where you talk about structures like the hippocampus <coughs> and the amygdala. So maybe what we'll be able to do today is put some of the anatomical features on to what you've heard in the a course on learning and memory. Okay. So limbic system is part of the really old, old part of our brains. Uh, it appears very early, especially in vertebrate phylogeny, and people think about it as it's kind of the emotional brain, the feeling, the reacting brain, the instinctual brain that gets interposed <coughs> between what we now evolve to call the thinking brain, meaning more of our well-developed prefrontal cortex. <clears throat> so the idea, and we'll look at this in a little bit of detail, is that there are functionally and anatomically nucle interconnected nuclei that pretty much are located either in the forebrain or the telencephalon and the diencephalon. In particular, we'll talk about connections to the hypothalamus and from the hypothalamus back to the thalamus. Kind of bringing in here, as we can see, some of what we talked about on Tuesday uh, and how these emotional stimuli can interact with some of the endocrine function of the hypothalamus, which we, we talked about last time. So these are, like I say, a lot of these are instinctual behaviors. When an infant is born, you don't have to teach it how to nurse. We, for whatever reason, many people have instinctual fear of snakes, even though a snake may never have them or did anything with them. There's just something intuitive that says somewhere in our evolutionary past, it was a good idea not to like snakes. And, you know, a lot of these instincts have, as you can see here, have to do with survival or reproductive instincts. And it can be a contest. When you're thirsty, water is more enjoyable. When you're hungry, food is more desirable. So initially, these are pretty much part of the brain that are essential for self-preservation and for the preservation of the species. So just a little bit of a history of what we know. Here's Paul Broca again, this is the same Broca who uh, not discovered but figured out where uh, he we generate speech, Broca's area in the brain. And he was a neurologist. He was looking at a lot of things. And in, back in 1878, he called it le grand lobe limbique. Limbique just means a ring. And he referred to this as this ring of tissue on the medial side of the cortex. And I'll show you a picture of that down here. And what we're talking about classically is the cingulate lobe or the cingulate gyrus, which we identified a long time ago. And if we remove the underlying brain stem, we can look through and look at the medial side of the temporal lobe at the same time. And we can see how the cingulate gyrus kind of hooks around behind the corpus callosum, continues down into temporal lobe on the medial side into what is referred to as the para <coughs> gyrus. And the para means around or next to. So the parahippocampal gyrus actually covers the main structures that we're going to talk about, the hippocampus and the amygdala. That's been expanded a little bit since um, the early concepts. So again, we still talk about the cingulate lobe, 
poking around. Here they kind of peeled away the parahippocampal gyrus. We can see the underlying hippocampus and this little green blob up at the front is the amygdala. But now the modern concept is that in addition to the cingulate lobe, we also are going to include some of this orbital part of our telencephalon, as well as some of the medial prefrontal cortex. And this will come back to this, especially this idea of the prefrontal cortex at the end of the uh, lecture today, when we talk a little bit about post-traumatic stress disorder and the role of that area in uh, uh, that disorder. Hayes, little moving forward a little bit, he put more of a functional uh, substrate onto the limbic system. And as I said, it's kind of like drive-related and emotional behavior. Of course, we know it's more than that right now. We also include things like learning memory uh, on top of that. It's not, you know, he did propose that the cingulate cortex along with the hippocampus and the, was part of um, this experiencing emotions and the physiological manifestations. <coughs> so again, we look at, at this image and notice that here, the cingulate lobe and the prefrontal cortex are color-coded green, and the posterior part of the cingular gyrus and the parahippocampal gyrus <clears throat> have more of a blue color. So what we now know from a lot of experiments is that there is a division between the role of the amygdala and the role of the hippocampus. It's very clear from the research that the amygdala and the anterior part of the cingulate lobe and this medial prefrontal cortex are primarily involved in mediating emotional responses, and in particular, fear responses, uh, anxiety type responses, and that the blue area, which includes the hippocampus and the Again, the parahippocampal gyrus that surrounds it, and the posterior <coughs> part of the cingulate lobe is where learning and memory reside. So rather than consider, you know, early on, a lot of the studies were just done by lesioning. You probably couldn't lesion the amygdala without lesioning the hippocampus. So everything was kind of pushed together like that. That's just what I what I just <clears throat> said. Uh, we're going to see that the hippocampus is going to be related to structures in the hypothalamus, like the mammillary bodies. And from there, there's going to be a projection to the thalamus, which then projects back to the cingulate lobe. And that's going to be more of our um, learning and memory pathways, whereas the amygdala is going to be uh, using pathways that use another nucleus in the thalamus called the dorsomedial nucleus and is then going to be related more to emotional context. Okay. We finally get those last two thalamic nuclei to talk about. So let's do a little anatomy first, and then we'll come back to a little function. So here's a cross-section, transverse section to the forebrain. And let's just enlarge this area down here in the temporal lobe over on this side. So here we see the cortical gyrus. This would represent what, would, what I showed you previously is the para hippocampal gyrus, and you can see how it overlies this structure <clears throat> uh, just deep to it. The space outlined here by the red lines is the lateral ventricle. Remember our lateral ventricle 
in, you can find it in all parts of the cerebral lobe, <coughs> external lobe, parietal lobe, occipital lobe, and then it actually swings around down into the temporal lobe. So here we're looking at that temporal portion of the lateral ventricle. And kind of pushing into it is this big structure. <coughs> at this point, we're a little bit posterior, so what we're looking at is the hippocampus. Although both of these structures are actually, the hippocampus and the amygdala are both in the temporal lobe, surrounded by that perihippocampal gyrus. And here's just kind of a, as though a projection, as though we were looking through the cortex, the most rostral pole, you see the red is the amygdala, purple is the hippocampus, and then coming off of the hippocampus is this big fiber tract, which you can actually see kind of in this area, called the fornix, and we'll, we'll talk about the fornix in a few minutes. So where does the name come from? We're going to focus on the hippocampus first. I'll, I'll come back to amygdala at the end. Well, if I were to remove parahippocampal gyrus, and just dissect out the hippocampus itself, kind of set it down like this, which is what the early anatomists did, and of course they said, well, we don't know what this is, but it looks like a seahorse. So we're going to call it the hippocampus. Hippo refers to a uh, horse. Okay? So that's kind of where name came from. And when we look at the hippocampus, we know this is old, it's archicortex, meaning <coughs> it only has three layers. Unlike the rest of our cortex that has six layers. And there are basically defined three parts. So again, here's the real, real life image, the cross section. And fortunately, this particular cross-section is very much oriented like this uh, schematic. So you can get a good sense of what, what we're looking at here. So when we talk about the hippocampus, we're talking about an area called the dentate gyrus, which is this area out here. And then, Kind of extending more laterally from that, we have in blue the hippocampus proper. We'll, we'll talk a little bit more about that. And then continuing, so this would be the dentate gyrus. Here's the hippocampus proper. And then notice how this part seems to just kind of extend off and it'll become continuous with that parahippocampal gyrus. And that's what we're looking at here. And that region is called the subiculum. And as we'll see, what's very interesting, <coughs> if you look at the dentate gyrus, and you look at the hippocampus proper, they form two interlocking seeds. So you can see here's one of the dentate gyrus, and then here's the other seed, the hippocampus proper. And it's very interesting because no matter what point of section you cut the hippocampus, you always see those two interlocking seeds. Does that have any functional significance? Probably not. The subiculum, this orange, these orange cells, notice we're beginning to transition here. We don't really have three distinct layers. This is kind of like, you could maybe make this be analogous to the cerebellar nuclei where you have a lot of processing going on in the hippocampus proper and the dentate gyrus, and then the hippocampus 
we're going to go through this a couple of times. So, but here's the blue axons coming into the subiculum, and notice they're synapsing on these subicular neurons. So the subiculum basically carries the output of the hippocampus. Those orange neurons, let's look at their axons. Some of them are going to a structure called the entorhinal cortex. We'll talk about what that means in a few minutes. But a lot of them are also performing this big bundle of axons that just sits almost forming like a capsule around the hippocampal area. You can see that here, these dark axons just sitting right outside this hippocampal region. And then those axons <coughs> come together and form a structure called the fimbria, and the fimbria ultimately will become the fornix. So this is the major output pathway of information that's been processed through the hippocampus <coughs> itself. Again, we're gonna go through this a couple of times. I always have lots of different pictures to show you to get, to get oriented. But any, any major questions at this point? Again, here's our axons coming, subiculum would be in this area. The axons gather, like I said, almost like a little shell on the outside of the hippocampus. And the first thing they do is they collect into the fimbria. I think fimbria means finger. So we see them coming along here, and this is happening bilaterally, of course. 
I can't tell you why they keep changing the name of the structure. I noticed that, but I don't know why. It's called Fimbria when it's sitting on top of the hippocampus, and then when those axons I don't know, begin to course more dorsally, we call them the crews. So the crews just means limb. And again, there's a right and a left crews. And then they come together here. So here you can see these crura. They then come together to form a single bundle, which we refer to as the body of the fornix. And here we go. Here's where they come together as we're going more rostrally. So this is going from caudal to rostral uh, in these images. And as they course rostrally, notice their relationship is <coughs> just ventral to the corpus callosum. And then they reach the area of the anterior commissure. And what you can notice here is some of the axons go anterior to the anterior commissure and some course posterior. The, and ones that go anterior are referred to as pre-commissural axons, and those are destined primarily for those septal nuclei and for the ventral striatum. The axons that go posterior to the commissure appropriately are called post-commissural axons. And here, you can kind of see it here. This was the diagram I used last uh, on Tuesday. They, here's our anterior commissure. Here's this, the bulk of the axons go posterior and they go through the hypothalamus and most of them are going to come down here to terminate in the mammillary bodies of the hypothalamus. And then there are projections from the mammillary body up to the thalamus itself. <coughs> we'll come back a little bit to those. Okay, everybody got kind of a, a vision of the fornix and where it's coming from and where it's going? Here again, we see the axons. Fimbria would be in this area, the crura. Here's the body of the fornix. And here's this big bundle going just posterior to the um, anterior commissure, the mammillary body. And from the mammillary body, we call it the mammalothalamic tract. It's coming up here to the anterior of the thalamus. Everybody got a good visual on that? But the other reason I have this one in here is just to point out why was this called the dentate gyrus? Well, if you kind of look here, you see this sawtoothed appearance. And that is the dentate gyrus. And this outer part would be the hippocampus proper. Where do we get those? Well, if you look here at this cross section, the schematic, notice that the dentate gyrus does sort of kind of protrude as a little bump. And that's what we're seeing here. Here's a bump, and then if we kept make going back a little bit further. At all levels, you see these little bumps sticking out uh, toward the ventri ventricle. And so you get this irregular shape of that area. 
you don't see that in the hippocampus proper, so that's kind of nice and smooth and rounded. fornix again, coming down, the mammillary bodies. I think I had it here first and then I moved it. Okay. Now, you've probably heard about this if you've taken, how many people have at least heard of the hippocampus? Oh, good. <laughs> you've, all, you've all taken some kind of course where they've talked about it, right? And classically, when we talk about the hippocampus, they divide it into what are called CA1, CA2, CA3, and CA4. And again, we can kind of see that on this, this long view of the, of the structure. Here's that little bump coming out in the other one. Did anybody ever tell you where the CA nomenclature came from? Did you ever hear where it came from? Here's the person that came up with that terminology. Raphael Lorente de Neu, back in 1934, another neurologist. <laughs> and he was kind of classically trained. And when he looked at the hippocampus, you know, he said, this looks a whole lot like the caricature of Amun Ra, who was one of the deities of the Egyptian <coughs> Empire. At its height, and this is kind of the, the ram's horn. <laughs> and so he called this Amon's horn or Cornu Amonis. C A. Okay? Just because early on he decided, you know, this has some relationship to what looks like this Egyptian god, I'm just going to call this these subdivisions. Or no, ominous one, two, and three. So we just say CA now. So now you know where it came from. If that, if you care. And we'll talk about the connections here. Just this is the only histology slide I have, but since I showed you cells in the cerebellum and the basal ganglia, I thought I'd show you. These are really pretty cells, also. I do. I, these are nice pyramidal cells. And these are pyramidal cells, even though this is archicortex and it's only three layers, these have the same shape as the pyramidal cells that we see in our neocortex. So these are just classic cells with a kind of pyramidal shaped cell body with basal and apical dendrites extending outward. In the dentate gyrus, there's a different population of cells, and they're called, don't get confused, they're called granule cells. They have no relationship to the granule cells in the cerebellum. They <coughs> look like the granule cells in the cerebellum, they're much bigger, and I don't know who got the name first, but the principal cell in the dentate gyrus they don't have the basal dendrites. They do have a different characteristic uh, appearance. Good news for a change. Both the pyramidal cells and the granule cells release glutamate, so they're excitatory to their targets. Again, we're going to kind of just talk in generalities as to afferents without going through a lot of specific, the only specific track you should know something about is the fornix, how it's formed, where it's going, uh, but we're not going to talk about all of the others. So, where is the hippocampus getting its information? Well, there's a portion of the parahippocampal gyrus, 
And it's this kind of this more anterior part. So if we look here, here's our temporal lobe. Here's kind of looking from front to back. Then take gyrus, the hippocampus. Here's the perihippocampal gyrus. The most rostral part of the perihippocampal gyrus is referred to as the entorhinal cortex. And that cortex is the primary source of input to the hippocampus. And where is the entorhinal cortex getting information? It gets input from all of the association areas of the frontal lobe, the parietal lobe, the occipital lobe, and the cingulate cortex. They're not all shown. I think the cingulate is shown on here. Main point here, these are the association areas, not the primary cortex from those areas. And remember, we've always said the association areas have much more complex function than primary sensory, primary motor, primary visual. So they're getting that information about color, about face recognition, about object recognition from the occipital lobe. They're getting information from those areas of the parietal lobe that are putting all of the sensory information together and allowing us to understand what it is we're touching. Uh, you know, from, from the uh, frontal lobe, that prefrontal cortex where planned movements and higher order uh, functions, decision making. So the entorhinal cortex is getting a tremendous amount of this information. And then, I know these are little, these little purple arrows are showing you that that information is then sent into the hippocampus for further processing. Now just, there are a few other areas that do project the hippocampus, the amygdala communicates with its compatriot in the back. <coughs> and here's our anterior commissure. Here's the post commissural. There's the pre commissural axons. But the septal nuclei also send information back to the hippocampus via the fornix. And the septal nuclei, this is like I said, it's cholinergic. There's a lot of reward and reinforcement going on in that particular area, which sending that back into the hippocampus. A little bit from the olfactory bulb in primates, Probably in lower vertebrates, that's a more important input because their world is all about scent. I was watching my neighbor's dogs this Sunday. I have a neighbor one side has two dogs, and the neighbor on the other side of me has one dog, and they kind of had a three, the three of us were out talking, and the dogs decided to have a play date. So they let them in, and what's the first thing a dog does? He goes in and they start sniffing each other's butts. And, you know, I don't know what kind of information they're getting, but they're getting something through that. And that's probably being processed somehow through this limbic pathway. Or, hmm, there's some kind of memory we have. It's kind of interesting, we have pets to watch. Yesterday I had my vet, my vet comes to my house. She took care of my, she sits on the floor, does her, does her thing, leaves. As soon as, of course, my cat hates it when she's there. But as soon as she leaves, 
he was right where she was sitting and just started sniffing and for some reason he started rolling around in her scent yesterday. But, you know, so they're using a little bit more of their olfactory system. We don't normally, that's not how we normally greet people or respond after they leave. Well, maybe you do, but that's up to you guys. Okay, so I want you to know this classic pathway. It's in the objectives. So they always talk about a classic trisynaptic intrinsic pathway, being consistent with circuitry a little bit. So let's start out. Here's the entorhinal cortex, and this would continue as the perihippocampal, and then on the other side, it continues as the subiculum. <coughs> so I showed you the subiculum coming out. The portion of the parahippocampal gyrus that first joins is this entorhinal cortex. Here are neurons in the entorhinal cortex, sending their axons into the dentate gyrus. And that is referred to as the perforant pathway. Right, so I do want you to know these, these names that we're going to bring up here. So entorhinal cortex, the dentate gyrus, is the perforant pathway. And some of those axons, just because you'll see this in books, do go to the CA3 region of the hippocampus, which is the part that's very close to the uh, <coughs> From the dentate gyrus, so here's our granule cell in the dentate gyrus, and it projects to the CA3 region via what is called a mossy fiber pathway. Again, nothing to do with mossy fibers in the cerebellum. I think the cerebellum was first, but they were probably working independently when they came up with these names. So we have step one, step two, and then from CA3, we have projections to the pyramidal cells in CA1. That is the classic, classically referred to as the trisynaptic pathway get information into the system. Now, we don't have time to go into all the physiology of what's happening, but ultimately, it's kind of like with the Purkinje cell, there's a tremendous, and each step along this pathway, there is a convergence of information onto the next neuron in line. So that information that might have come in from the occipital lobe could be paired with information from the parietal lobe. And we'll talk a little bit about how that, how we think that works in terms of remembering something. Everybody okay with that? You probably have talked about this, I presume, in some of the courses you've taken. You just said, here, here's input to the hip Okay, so while we have this up here, let's also just review the output pathway then. From CA1, after it gets all this information, does all this processing, here's our projection from CA1 to the subiculum. Subiculum feeds back to the entorhinal cortex. And as we said before, it also forms the fornix, which goes to, ultimately, to the hypothalamus. And from there to the thalamus, back to a lot of these areas. So there's kind of the, on this one slide, you've got the whole system of hippocampal circuitry.
And again, with this convergence, we just don't have time, and I, I kind of took it out this year for, to talk about things like long-term LTP, long-term deviation, and how that is related to learning and memory. But if you come to 3010, we talk about that more. There's more time to develop that. So basically, that's the circuit. This is just showing you that again. Here's CA1 projecting to the entorhinal cortex. And then the entorhinal cortex basically goes back to the same areas that sent an input, as well as via the fornix, another view septum and ventral striatum via those pre-commissural axons, post-commissural to the mammillary body, <coughs> the anterior thalamic nucleus, and a couple of other nuclei in the hypothalamus. Any questions on that? Thank you. 
cells. And these fire when an animal is in a very specific spot. So if the mouse was walking across the table, and then you were screaming or worrying about him, when you got to the point, say right at the beginning, there would be a group of neurons in the hippocampus that would fire, telling him you are in this location. And then he moves, and another group of cells, and another group, and another group. The grid cells kind of add on to that by giving that directionality. If he wants to go from here, say he doesn't want to go straight down the table, he wants to go that way first, the grid cells would provide him with that directional information. He's learned for some reason that when he sees that green coat, that's going to take him, maybe there's food in the pot. So the entorhinal cortex and the hippocampus in terms of localization, where am I in space again, are working together. One is telling you where you are and the other one is telling you how to get somewhere else. Does that make sense? And somebody got a Nobel Prize for discovering that very recently. About what? What about rats in space? Do they have any visits to lippy cells? Well, even if you're in space, you know, if you don't change the cues, now they're gonna float maybe to get there, but I don't I don't know. I've never read the studies, and I know they've done a lot of these studies with animals and going that are up on the space station. A lot of work has been being done with those questions. I would have to go out and look up the literature to see where they're at with that. Good question. For one thing, you are losing some of that sensory input, which is going to make, a, make it a little bit more difficult. But if your visual cues are, are still there, I think you'd be OK. And this is just another interesting study Apparently, cab drivers in London, taxi drivers, for them to get a license, they have to prove that they know how to get from point A to any other part in the city. And then if they tell them, okay, now you're gonna start here, how do I get there? They're supposedly some of the best in terms of knowing how to get where you wanna go. And what they've looked at is for whatever reason, the posterior hippocampus seems to be more involved in this spatial uh, information. The posterior hippocampus, the taxi drivers, seems to be kind of hemisphere related, but the volume of their hippocampus is larger. And the longer they've been driving, the larger it gets. So plasticity. They're forming new synaptic connections. They're getting more input in terms of helping them to get around. So there's the kind of in action. Okay, let's just do, I can't do hippocampus without talking a little bit about memory. Memory, this is kind of a simplistic view. We have different types of memory, like declarative. Declarative is probably what we rely on quite a bit in our daily life. <coughs> this is a, what they call available to us. So we're talking about phone numbers, words, words to a song, past events, history, words and their meaning, learning neuroanatomy, those words that we, we all come to appreciate. Non-declarative, these are more, and again, this probably involves some input from cerebellum or uh, connections with it, but shooting a basket, solving a puzzle, playing a piano. You can do that without a medial temporal lobe, and we know that because there's a lot of that from the cortex for the cerebellum, there's others systems involved. 
And declarative can get divided further into what's called semantic, general knowledge, fact, concepts, neuroanatomy of the limbic system of the cerebellum. You're using your semantic memory probably now. And episodic, which is where we remember things that have happened, things that have occurred uh, in, our, in our life. So using this episodic memory, again, information is coming in from our association areas. Here's the uh, entromyome and adjacent part of the perihippocampal uh, gyrus. So maybe we're getting some kind of object information. I can feel this. I know it's hard. I've identified it as a mouse. Or maybe you have object information, say an apple pie, spatial information. We had apple pie at my grandmother's house last week, or maybe we're going to hopefully have it on Easter if we go there again. So it's taking where did something occur, where did something about the object, maybe this coming from the olfactory cortex, the scent of the pie. Maybe it's coming from the visual cortex, what it looked like, that wonderful crust and apple bubbling out. So that's the information that's coming here into our entorhinal cortex, or the perirhinal, the, uh, the cortex just before the entorhinal. And then all of that information kind of comes together, put that in, into the entorhinal cortex. And maybe that's where we put it all together. When I, when I went out to the restaurant and I smelled the apple pie, I remember grandma, maybe it was Thanksgiving, all of that information will come into this area, and there we can do it, we're gonna send it into the hippocampus. If it just stays in the hippocampus, we, we're not gonna remember it for very long. Hippocampus is more involved in acquiring the memories. And then, here's our fornix, goes through these systems to the thalamus, goes up to that prefrontal cortex, and that's the area where somehow, which you know, we don't really know how that all happens, that's where it gets permanently stored, and where we can then go and do a recall. That's an area that gets primarily involved in Alzheimer's disease as well. When you begin to you lose, you lose those. <coughs> there is a syndrome called Korsakoff's syndrome. It's usually due to a vitamin B1 deficiency. You see it quite common in individuals who are alcoholics because they're not eating properly. Um, if you have some eating disorders or, so, or a, a clinical a medical disorder with prolonged vomiting, some chemotherapy, and one of the symptoms is confusion, loss of mental activity, loss of muscle coordination, and you may actually go into withdrawal syndromes. Why would they see loss of muscle coordination say in an alcoholic situation, um, hippocampus doesn't have anything to do with coordination. Anybody remember what we talked about with cerebellum? Is the cerebellum sensitive to alcohol? So this is just a, sy a syndrome that crosses over. I, I told you at that time, Alcohol has two areas that it really impacts on the <coughs> cerebellum and the hippocampus. So you get this syndrome where the energy cells are dying, so you lose the coordination, and you're continually losing some of that memory. Okay, last little bit about memory. 
we can take this memory and we can divide it kind of into temporal categories. Immediate memory, perhaps you don't hang on to the memory for very long. You know, you get a, you get a bug bite, you think it hurts, and then you forget about it. Short-term memory, that's where you can hold on to these memories for a little longer. And if you've ever gone in for, if you've ever been a, a volunteer or conscripted volunteer for some of these psychology where they'll give you a list of structures and you have to remember them. And then 10 minutes later, they'll ask you, okay, what were the names? What were the, you know, what were the words that I asked you to remember? I'm at a stage now when I go to my position tests all the time. So she'll give you four or five words and then 10 minutes later says, well, what were those words? And hopefully you can recall them. And long-term memory, of course, are the memories that we store and, and keep for a long time. And, you know, that those long-term memories, that's where the consolidation occurs that we just looked at. That's very complex from what we know now. There's gene expression changes, protein synthesis, synaptic plasticity, and that's where the LTP comes into play because those are permanent changes in synaptic efficacy. And again, we don't have time to do that in, in this course. But the other thing that this little diagram shows you, okay, Immediate memory, we forget. Short-term memory, I can remember those words while I'm in the doctor's office. By the time I get home, they're not important to me, so you know, I'm not gonna hang on to those words forever. And long-term memory, of course. And the important point here is that forgetting is as important as acquiring memories. Just think if you could not ever forget anything, and there are individuals who actually have that problem. And they talk about how that really compromises their life because it's always like these memories are always flooding in on them. So just as an example, here's a bunch of pictures of pennies. Do I really need to know what a penny actually looks like to use it? <coughs> so in this whole thing, only one of those is the real penny. Try to hold that memory for at least one more week, okay? Or re when you review it, you can also recall is also important. Anybody here not know who patient HM is? He was a patient, of course, who had a young man who had seizures. I think it was probably back in the 50s. And the surgery they did was to do a bilateral resection of his temporal lobe, medial temporal lobe. Took out hip, both hippocampi. Cured the seizures, or at least reduced them, but he could never form new memories. He could remember things from the past, but you could walk into the room, I, my name's Georgia, how are you? Oh, nice to meet you. Two minutes later, who are you? Why are you here? And he was the subject of a lot of studies. A lot of people worked with him uh, in terms of testing and trying to understand. And that's where we really learned a lot about the fact that don't take out both in camp by. Okay? Not, not a good <coughs> He died fairly recently, and they actually, obviously he donated his brain, and they sectioned it, and they sectioned it on video. You could, you could go out to YouTube or whatever it was they did it, and watch him slicing this brain. I'm not sure why, 
but some people tuned in to see them cutting it, but they had it. So, you know, you can get, you can have memories before the surgery, not more than two years earlier, probably, but from that point on, you are not gonna have any new memory. This would be kind of scary, too. Okay, again, Alzheimer's disease, probably the CA1 area. Let's just look at the mean. Normally in the control, you have about 6.89, whatever, whatever the factor is here. Uh, let's say <coughs> neurons in Alzheimer's disease that gets significantly, about 10 to 6, yeah, but gets significantly reduced in that area probably gets pretty hard weight, it gets pretty hard. Okay, we're not going to spend quite as much time going through the, all the same circuitry, but let's finish up with the amygdala. So amygdala, is, amygdala means almond, so it's just a little almond shaped structure in the front of the, uh, the cortex. Related to the anterior cingulate lobe and the insular cortex. So, hippocampus for memory, learning, spatial orientation. Amygdala is mostly involved for emotional type responses. How did we, a lot of the work done was this group, Kluver and Busey. They specifically um, would, if you stimulated the amygdala, you would get feelings of fear and apprehension. And what happened was they then removed the amygdala. Move the temporal lobes, including the amygdala. They did it bilaterally. And now, monkeys were fearless. They had kind of blunted emotions. They didn't get excited. They didn't do anything, really. Again, the reason for doing the increased oral activity, they would just put anything in their mouth. Not sure where that all comes from. And the increased sexual behavior, I'm guessing, has a lot to do with projections that were no longer going to the hypothalamus, where that area is regulated. So kluver busey syndrome is a loss of the amygdala, and you get this, okay, nothing bothers me in the world. A little bit of fear is good. A little bit of apprehension, you know, you want to pay attention. You're walking out at night, especially like down on High Street or something where the police don't be as late. Um, you want to be aware of what's going on and be a little bit alert. And then the future, the, as we move forward, the studies showed that the amygdala was the one that was mediating this. to the amygdala, again, lots of sense, a lot of sensory information. Again, these are the association areas, not the primary areas. So auditory, uh, visual, one of those things. There's some brainstem inputs, periodic <coughs> brain, and here are these other nuclei that we really haven't talked about. That's bringing in information related to the autonomic nervous system, hypothalamus, those septal nuclei, and the thalamus itself. I'm going to put this together on a, on a different slide. This was an interesting study that was also done. The amygdala can respond, and you can, you can see if they're reporting, this little yellow dot is just showing levels of activity. And it can respond 
to various facial expressions. So it's not involved in facial recognition. It knows who you are, unlike that lesion that we talked about in the other part of the temporal lobe, where you didn't recognize the person, that truscal technosia. Here, you're looking at the face and you're trying to say, is that person mad at me? And is he happy? Is he sad? You know, I have a little trouble going through all of these and saying, is this one much different from that one? But it's kind of going from a happy face to one that really looks scared. And the amygdala responds to that. So it's giving us some information. Again, this is just showing the regional cerebral blood flow. Looking at a happy versus, especially it's going to respond more to a face that looks fearful or perceived of as being fearful. There's another weird disease called orbach white disease. And it selectively destroys the amygdala, kind of calcifies it. And these people have difficulty discerning emotions and facial expressions. They can, again, they know who the person is, but they can't discern it. So here's this individual that's kind of an empty space there now in the temporal lobe. The hippocampus is present, but the amygdala are missing. No more, no sensory impairment, cognitive is fine. So here was another patient she kind of had a very specific area. So here were, so they took patients who had other types of brain damage, say from a stroke or MS, and they showed them the faces and they rated the relative context and they could identify happy, surprised, afraid. And this patient, she, was, she did okay with some of the other emotions but she could not identify a face that appeared to be showing fear. And they then asked her to draw the different emotions. And she could draw a happy, a sad, a surprise, a stuff. I don't know why she thought a baby crawling was an afraid face. But be that as it may, that was her interpretation. So clearly, we use that information to know how should I react to this person right now. Here's kind of the, the take home message. So you can do these pairings. Here's a little mouse. You give him a gentle foot shot. He's going to have a response. And then you pair it with some kind of an auditory tone. And that will act, so all he's got to do now is hear the tone, and he's ready for that foot shot. And you can see here, I'm not going to ask you for all of this specifically, but the key thing is to notice here the nucleus of the amygdala, it's activating the hypothalamus for sympathetic control, parasympathetic activation, respiration, uh, releasing of dopamine, norepinephrine, and acetylcholine. We'll talk about that in the last lecture, how that alters behavior. Reflexes, <coughs> behavior, ACTH release, stress response. So the amygdala is going to all of these areas and you can see how they relate to how I'm going to respond to something that I perceive of as being fearful or potentially dangerous. One more on this, and there are, I think, two more slides. This is another study that they do. They, they've done it in the <coughs> And they do what's called a skin conductive response. And they can measure, basically, it's a lie detector test. They're measuring resistivity in your skin. They put little electrodes on your skin and see how you respond to some of these stimuli. And they pair that with a lot of Wolfhorn. So in control subjects, you give them a lot of Wolfhorn and they're going to respond. Skin, con skin conductance is going to increase. 
neutral sound, not so much. And then you ask them, what did we just do? And they'll remember what happened. And they can explain, okay, this is what I heard, and, and this is what happened. Amygdala damage, they don't respond to either really very much, the conditioned or the neutral sound. But they can still tell you what the experiment, what you were doing, what they heard. Lesion, the hippocampus, they still have a good response to the condition stimulus. A little bit of a, there's a stronger response to the neutral. And then you say, this would be HM, so what did we just do? And you go, oh, did you do something? No, I can't remember. And of course, if you take both of them out, you lose the memory, you lose the, this response. So again, more tests to show that. Okay, let's just bring this in. There are these memories that sometimes, you know, if I asked you what we had for lunch a week ago, you go, um, I don't know, it's not important. But we have what are called flashbulb memories. And these are memories that it's like you never forget. You know exactly where you were when something happened. And, you know, sometimes it's traumatic. It could be happy. It could be a happy memory. Uh, for me, my flashbulb memories, among uh, many, I remember exactly where I was when John, we heard that John Kennedy had been shot. I was in high school, we just come back from lunch, I could visualize the whole thing, we were sent home. I don't know, I'd have to ask you guys, what are, you, what are your events that you always will say, well, 9-11 would be another one of those flashbulb memories where you can think back to exactly, of course you guys are maybe too young for that, but you know, remember, some of us remember exactly where we were. Could be, you know, maybe a happy, Winning or something where you always have those memories that can be carried with, an, with a, uh, a pleasant memory. But this is now thought to be the basis of uh, post traumatic stress disorder, which of course you hear a lot about now, especially with people returning from overseas from the various, from Iraq and Afghanistan. And it's like you can never lose that memory. You always associate it with a particular sound. Or, you know, they talk about going to Fourth of July fireworks, or maybe just hearing fireworks in a neighborhood. And for the people with PTSD from combat, they associate that with the gunfire or the bombs that they heard before. So it's like you're always re experiencing that event. And unfortunately, there's a high rate of suicide in these individuals and substance abuse. Um, perhaps 50% will, will all experience some kind of traumatic event. And fortunately, it's, it's not <coughs> about 5% of men and 9% of women will develop PTSD from that traumatic event. <coughs> and here's my last to what we know now, where um, we're, we're, they're studying with this. So these are the controlled subject and the PTSD, and they both exposed to trauma. One developed PTSD, the other, the control, didn't. So they would do the usual conditioning that I just showed you, and you know, they gave the control shock PTSD patient had a really strong skin reaction, but even a pretty strong reaction to the stimulus that wasn't associated. Not so much on the control side. And then they did what was called an extinction, where they just didn't do the test for a very long time. And actually, this is what we're looking at here is the extinction study. The PTSD patient, even after he was not exposed to that, was still having a very strong response compared to the control subject. 
control subject over here. Okay. So what they are looking at now, remember that prefrontal cortex that I said was associated with the amygdala? And what they're finding is patients with PTSD, when they're exposed to these tra traumatizing events, their ventral medial prefrontal cortex does not activate. <coughs> In the control subject, that does. The amygdala is highly activated in these individuals compared to the control. And the idea now is that one of the things the ventral medial prefrontal cortex is doing for most of us, if I hear a loud bang, we're all going to react. But then it's, my prefrontal cortex is going to say, don't worry, it was just somebody dropping a book. It was just somebody closing the door. So it modulates that fear response. Because the prefrontal cortex is not doing that for the patients with PTSD, they can't separate it out. They can't realize this is not what I heard once before. So a lot of work is being done now to try to figure out why is that happening? What's going on with the prefrontal cortex? And I mean, obviously, it's not a simple disorder. A lot of work is now is really becoming important to do even more work on it. So that was a 